Before the podcast begins, I need your attention. In the next few minutes, I'm going to ask you to support our organization, Torch, in our annual campaign, our annual fundraiser that's happening right now at givetorch.org. You can find the link in the description of the podcast. Now, you may be resistant to my efforts. That's okay. I'm going to do my best to persuade you that this is a good idea to pause the podcast right now and to click the link and to visit givetorch.org and to support the great work of Torch. Our organization, Torch, it's a non-profit organization. We don't charge for our classes, for our facility, for our podcasts. And the only way we can do our sacred work, the only way we can continue our sacred work, it's only if we fundraise. And I'll tell you, I don't know about anyone else, I didn't go to rabbi school to learn how to fundraise. And in fact, it wasn't even part of the curriculum, but it's part of the job. Fundraising is not the reason why any of us got into this field. We don't like to fundraise. So a few years ago, my colleagues and I here at the Torch Center, we made a decision to compress all of our annual fundraising into one campaign, one fundraiser that we do one week a year, maybe a week and a half, and that's it. And for one week, one and a half weeks, we work really hard trying to get all of our friends and all the listeners, everyone to chip in, to support us. And if we succeed, if everyone makes their annual gift to Torch right now, givetorch.org, then we could take off our fundraising hat and put it in the shelf until next year. And this is happening right now. So today I'm asking you for your friendship, for your support, for your partnership. Visit givetorch.org. The link is in the description. Every donation is doubled. There's a matching campaign. So your your money goes even further. Give what you can give and help make this campaign a success. So please right now, pause, pause, hit pause. And visit givetorch.org. Dot org and give what you can to support Torch and the Torch Podcasts, and I deeply appreciate that. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll wait, I'll wait. I'm not going anywhere. Hit pause. Take your time. I got plenty of time. Visit givetorch.org. Okay, if you are back from your pausing, you heeded my call, and you made a donation at givetorch.org, then all you have to do right now is just fast forward. Fast forward a few minutes until the podcast. But if you're not convinced, you're not yet persuaded, let me try a little harder. Let me try to persuade you. Over the course of the past year, with the help of the Almighty, I've released hundreds of podcast episodes. Over the course of my podcasting career, it's more than 1,500 episodes. And every day, every other day, basically, it's a new podcast. And I work effectively all my time on this craft. And I consider it to be a a sacred task. I feel like to a certain extent, I'm serving as somewhat of an ambassador to spread the Almighty's Torah, to teach, to spread Jewish pride, Jewish knowledge, Jewish history, to do this work. And it's not just me. All my colleagues here at the Torch Center were similarly laser focused on the mission to connect Jews and Judaism. So we're doing that locally here in Houston, but of course around the world via our digital offerings. And today I want to ask you for your partnership. We cannot do this alone. We need partners. How do you become a partner, you may ask? Anyone who donates and contributes to the Torch fundraiser at givetorch.org, anyone who does that becomes a partner. If you give what you can give, you're elevated. You're no longer a junior associate. You're a partner. You can make partner. Your parents will be proud of you. And there are some perks that come with partnership. And it's the greatest perk in the world. It's the merit of Torah all over the world. People are studying together and learning together and listening alongside us. I'm here at the Torch Center and I work here day in, day out, week in, week out to prepare exquisite content of Torah, of Jewish life, of Jewish history, and to disseminate it with the help of the Almighty worldwide. But this is not just my own enterprise. This is not just my colleagues here at the Torch Center. We have partners. 
and those who support us, who give what they can give at givetorch.org, they become partners and they have a major portion of the merit of what, of what we do. Not everyone can do what we do. Some of y'all are employed, gainfully employed. So you hire us, you partner with us, you outsource your responsibility to spread Torah to your friends here at the Torch Center and all the incredible work that we do here. If you give a lot, that's amazing. Every donation is matched. It's all doubled at givetorch.org. If you can give a little, we love and we cherish that as well. As long as you give what you can give, you are a partner. And I'd like to get this on the record. I want to say it publicly, on the record. The merits that we have in spreading Torah, in enriching people's spiritual lives, in feeding souls the world over, and the fact that the messages that we share are shared in countless Shabbos tales around the world, and people are sharing it with their friends and their neighbors and their community members. This entire empire of Torah that emanates from the modest torch center in Houston, I hereby declare that those merits are shared with everyone who contributes. All the partners are included. And the opposite. That's true as well. Those who sadly don't contribute, they're not partners, and they don't get any of the merits. The Torch fundraiser at givetorch.org, and the link is in the description. It's not just an opportunity, there's also the opportunity cost of passing. I want your partnership. I want your friendship. I want your listenership. Of course, we love all the listeners. Anyone who says, I want to put on a Torch podcast, I want to listen and learn together, they're cherished. They're beloved, they're special. But only those who contribute to this campaign, to this fundraiser at givetorch.org, only those people are elevated to partner. Only those people get a portion in our merit. Yes, if you study, if you learn, you will have an incredible merit for your own study. That's nothing to sneeze at. But the merit of all the listeners, the more than a million downloads every year, that merit is only for those who contribute. I think it's a good deal. I told my class on Sunday that the Torch Center in Houston, Texas, Torch, it's certainly the best charity in Texas. And it's likely the best, you know, west of the Mississippi. I don't know. In in New York, New Jersey, they have some great yeshivas. Maybe those eclipse us. The bane for your buck here is, is staggering. The amount of people who are touched The amount of people whose lives are changed as a result of what we do here, it's staggering. The amount of emails that I have people who who were touched, who were moved, it's, it's, it's hard to believe that a small little outfit, a little mom and pop shop here in the Torch Center, what we're able to do, it's just a gift from Hashem and it's in the merit of maybe our illustrious antecedents, but it's also in the merit of our incredible partners. And if you're listening and you haven't been persuaded, you're like, okay, skip, 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 skip. Finally get to the content. When will this pitch end? I'm done with this appeal. I get it. I know what you want. I'm not interested. I'm still urging you. I'm asking you. I'm pleading. Not pleading. Not pleading. Not pleading. I'm beseeching. No, I'm not beseeching. I'm asking. I'm requesting you to hit pause. Visit the fundraiser. GiveTorch.org. The link is in the description. And give what you can give. If you do that, you're joining a very special fraternity. You're you're coming to the other side of the table. You're a team member now. If we succeed in reaching our goal, I hereby pledge with the help of the Almighty to continue doing this very important sacrosanct work. I was assured by my friend David that in the event, God forbid, that we're unable to reach our goal and we have to, God forbid, shudder he did promise me that he'll he'll give me a job as a paralegal in his law firm. What do you think? I think that if I had to hang up the microphone, I probably would be better suited for that sort of work. I, I don't know, manual labor, a mechanic, a carpenter. Everyone has to know their limitations. But a paralegal, well, I could probably pull that off, I imagine. Maybe the, the, the skills that I picked up in yeshiva, debating Talmud, that would help, I think, in the, in the law profession. What do you think? Is that a good option? I really hope it won't come to that. 
I really hope that you take some time. You hit pause on the podcast and you come give us some love at givetorch.org. You seize this amazing opportunity. You give me a boost. You partner with us. You plant a big, juicy smile on my face. What I need from you is to give what you can give at givetorch.org. I know it's hard. I know it's a hassle. I know I took up a lot of your time trying to persuade you, but it's worth it. Over the course of my 12 years here at, at Torch, with the help of the Almighty, I've met many people who, who contributed financially to Torch. I haven't met a single one who regretted giving. It's always hard to give initially, but once you give, there's no regret. So push yourself. Visit givetorch.org. Give what you could give. You won't regret it. And I want to thank you for another amazing year of Torch Podcasts. I'm eternally grateful to you for your support, for your listenership, for your friendship, and please God for your partnership at givetorch.org. The link is in the description. And until next podcast that has this pitch or next year, thank you so much for supporting our work. My email address is RabbiWolby at gmail.com. Today's subject is a fun one, but also I think a very important one. And that is the study of Hebrew as a language, as the language of the Almighty, as the language of the Torah, as the language of the Jewish people, as the original language, as the eternal language, as the alpha language from which all other languages flow. I want to talk about it on a few different levels and dimensions. And I want to also end with a bit of a clarion call that we should all try to boost our knowledge of Hebrew and specifically biblical Hebrew so that we can study the Torah and all the Torah literature in the original text. We're living today in the golden age of mass availability of Torah. For really the first time in history, Torah has been available ubiquitously in effectively every language. And it's it's easy. It used to be that everything got the copy by hand and it was very inaccessible and it was hard to find many books. But now we have we have podcasts on demand all the stuff on video, all the books, all the translation, the Talmud's been translated, of course, the Torah, Tanakh, all that is available. And I think it's a beautiful thing because that makes the Almighty's wisdom accessible to all, and there's never really been a time like this. And some may argue, well, the study of Hebrew, well, it's a bit unnecessary given the unprecedented availability of Torah in English. So today I want to talk about why maybe that's not a good argument, why there's a lot lost in translation, but more broadly, what makes biblical Hebrew, what makes Hebrew so special? Why is it considered the holy tongue? Why is it incredibly valuable for us as well today? Why it's important for us to gain a familiarity and to even deepen and expand our knowledge of this language. So if you don't know any Hebrew, this may encourage you to undertake perhaps the study of this language. Maybe you'll be nudged to go learn it. If you are well-versed, if you are conversant in Hebrew, you'll have a deeper appreciation of this incredible, majestic language. The sources all agree that Hebrew is a very special language uniquely, singularly special language. Now, to be precise, we're calling it Hebrew, but in the sources it's called Lashon HaKodesh, which means the holy tongue. We could call it even biblical Hebrew. It is not necessarily the same language that's spoken today as modern Hebrew. It's the ancient, original Hebrew. We're going to use the colloquial term of Hebrew, but we're really referring to the language of the Torah, the holy language, the Lashon HaKodesh, the biblical Hebrew. The sources indicate that there's something divine 
in this language. The Talmud tells us that when God created the world, he used the language of Hebrew. And the Talmud even says, this world was created with the letter He, and the world to come, the other world, the parallel world, that is created with the letter Yud. I don't know what that means exactly, but it means that Hebrew, classic Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, that was part of the creation process. Now, we do see that Bitzalel, who is the chief architect of the Mishkan, what made him special, the Talmud tells us, is that he understood the art, or maybe the science, of world building using letters. Yodea haya Betzalel. Betzalel knew, the Talmud tells us. This is in the book of Brachos, page 55a. Betzalel knew how to combine the letters through which heaven and earth were created. So this tells us, A, well, how was heaven and earth created? How did God do Genesis? The Torah doesn't tell us really how he did it. It says us that it tells us that he did do it. It doesn't say exactly what method he used. The Talmud tells us he used the letters. It wasn't that the letters were incidental to the creation. That is how he did it. And but Solomon knew this. And that's how he created, so to speak, a world of his own, namely the Mishkan, the tabernacle, which is a version of a world, which is, again, another fascinating idea that the building, the construction of the tabernacle, of the portable temple that the nation had in the wilderness, the place where God's presence would rest, the place where the sacrifices were done, the epicenter of holiness in the world, to do that properly, you have to know how to build worlds. You have to know how to build worlds, not just to build worlds in general. You have to know how to build the worlds the way God build world, build, builds worlds. And Batala knew that secret, and that's why he was the right candidate to be the architect of the Mishkan. Now, Rashi cites from the Midrash that we could prove from Genesis you don't even need the Talmud, not the Talmud about the letter He or Betzalel, just from reading Genesis chapter 2. You could prove definitively that the world was created with, with Hebrew. How so? Chapter 2, verse 23 of Genesis. The verse tells us that Adam... He gave a name to Eve. He called her Isha. And he explains his rationale. Why did he call her Isha? Because she was taken from an Ish. Now, a name could transcend languages. You could have the name Yaakov, for example, and it could be a a Russian name, and it could be a, a name in English, it could be a name in Hebrew. The fact that the word Isha is taken from the word Ish. Ish Ish means man. That tells us that the original language, that is Lashon HaKodesh, and that's the language that Adam spoke in. There's another important point which is very relevant to our discussion here that's featured in this verse that separates, that differentiates between Hebrew and all other languages. Humans need language to communicate. In fact, the the primary definition of a human is a speaking being. Humans are able to articulate. That is what differentiates us from animals. So we need language, but what is the basis for the language? So, well, we could just agree Every year they come out with the, the list of the words of the year, the, the list that the, the Webster's, Miriam Webster added to its corpus of words. The new words. What makes 
a word, an official word, people start using it. It starts off maybe as slang or someone coins a term and it gains some steam, it gains popularity, it has some leads to it. And there's a mutual agreement effectively to start to use this word for this thing or this phenomenon. Hebrew does not work like that. Hebrew, and we'll see evidence to this idea, the word is the description of the essence of the thing that is being, being used over here, that the word is using to describe. So if, if a woman is called an Isha, well, the definition of the woman of Eve, at least in, in that context, is that she was taken from a man, and thus the essence of this woman is Isha, and that's why that's the proper name for it. In fact, just as a way to understand it, the word for thing and the word for word, it's the same word, because every word is that thing. Now, the way this plays out is that you have many examples of this. Words that are, that are homonyms. So the two words that are pronounced the same way, but have different meanings. And this is always maddening for someone who's trying to learn a new language is that you'll see so many words that sound the same and they have divergent meanings. In Hebrew, if there are two words that have, that are pronounced the same, they have the same root word, they must be intrinsically, philosophically, essentially connected. So, as an example, uh, the word hoda'a, mode, toda. It means both to show your gratitude, your appreciation, to give thanks, and it also means to admit. And it's been pointed out that the essence of gratitude is the acknowledgement of the goodness done to you. So you're acknowledging something, you're admitting something. That is the essence of gratitude, of appreciation. The Hebrew word for ear, ozen, oznaim. The Hebrew word for balance, or a balancing scale, is moznaim. Mi'uzan means to be balanced. Today we know why. We know that, that part of the function of the ears is to give a person balance. I did some research on this today. There are all sorts of sensors in the ears that give a person balance, which is why if you're a stew, you'll feel off because those those sensors are out of line. So someone government who has an ear disorder, they'll have balance problems. Now, we know that today because, you know, the advancements of our study in science and anatomy, but in Hebrew, the fact that we have two words that don't seem to be at all connected, the ears that are perched on the side of your face, and balance doesn't seem to be connected. Now we know how they are connected. Now, the secrets and the, the, the genius really, it's not limited to the words and to the language. It goes down to the le- level of the letters. Hebrew language, it's all on a different transcendental level, including the letters. The Talmud of the book of Shabbos, page 104a, it goes through the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters, and it shows how the word, the word has all sorts of lessons and secrets in it, meaning the word of the letter. So like, you know, the letter Y, as in Yaakov, or W, as in Walby, what does the word W mean? doesn't mean anything. It's not even a W. It's like a double V. 
What does the word V mean? It doesn't mean anything. In, in Hebrew, the Talmud goes through all these incredible lessons just from the names of each of the 22 letters of the alphabet. And then it tells us that even the order, the sequencing of these letters, even that has deep insight and meaning to it. And it gives a classic example. The word sheker. Sheker means falsehood. A lie is a sheker. That's spelled with three different letters. The shin, and then the kuf, and then the resh. These three letters are all next to each other in the alphabet. Says the Talmud, why, why are these letters so close to each other? Whereas the word emet or emes, it's very distant. The first letter is the aleph, the last letter is the saf, and the mem is right in the middle. So the Talmud asks this interesting question. Like the true and false, truth and falsehood, the way those both words comprised of three letters. But in the alphabet, the word sheker for false was all bunched together. And the word emes is all spread out. Says the Talmud, this teaches us a lesson. Sheker, falsehood, it's very common. You'll find it all bunched together. When it comes to emes, you got to work really hard to see it. To find truth, You'll see one, and then you'll go a very long time, you won't see any, any, any more. And then you'll see another one. It's never, you'll never see bunches of truth. Continues the Talmud. If you look how these words are spelled. So, there's the picture of every letter, right? The, the shape of the letter. And the shin, it comes down to a point in the bottom. So, if you were to just look at the letter shin, and you just imagine it in a, in three dimensions, Right? Like a big shin on your table, you put it down on the point and it tips over. Just like by the dentist, right? They don't want you to carry your cup. So they they have those cone-shaped cups. So you can't put it down anywhere, right? You drink and you you just spit it out, right? You throw it out in the garbage. The shin's like that. It comes to a point. And the kuf as well. It's got just, you know, one little leg. You put it, if it were, if it were to be three-dimensional, you put it, you put it on a table, topples over. And the resh, the final letter of sheker, too, it only has one leg, one pointy leg, it falls to the ground. Why? Because sheker ain't lower glaim. Sheker doesn't have any legs. Falsehood doesn't endure. Yeah, you can prop it up a little bit, fine. Otherwise, it'll just topple over. And eventually, it's destined to fall down. Whereas the word emes... The olive has two legs. It's sturdy. The mem has a flat bottom. Sturdy. The saf has two legs. It endures. Now, these are some examples, but this is indicative of the entire language. It's comprised of all these secrets down to the letters and even the shapes of the letters. Each letter is associated with a number, as we know, the gematria system. The... Gematria of the first letter, Aleph, is one. Bez is two. Gimel is three. Dalit is four. Goes all the way up to the number 10. And then it doesn't go 11 or 12. On, well, let me just clarify. Under the basic system of Gematria, because there are many different systems of Gematrias. On the basic system of Gematria, it goes from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 100. 10 at a time. And then it goes 100, 200, 300. And the last letter, the tough, the saf is 400. The Gona of Vilna points out something beautiful. The word bechor means a firstborn. And it's spelled with a bez, and then a chaf, and then a resh, bechor. The numerical value of these three respective letters, the base is two, Aleph base, two. The Chaf is 20. And the Resh, well, that's 200. 
So the God of Vilna said, the word Bechar refers to a firstborn. What does a firstborn get? The law of the firstborn, that the firstborn gets, that's the Torah law. Double portion in the inheritance. There are only three letters, says the Golden of Vilna, in all 23 letters of the, 22 letters of the alphabet, that the numerical value of that letter is double the letter of the letter that came before it. Aleph is one, double that's two. Base is two. Yud is ten, double that is twenty, chaf. Kuf is a hundred. And Reish is two hundred. The only three, three letters that are double the one that preceded it, that's the word Bechar, to tell you, it's a little hint, a little wink, a little wink and a nod, but that's the letter, that's the essence, it's double. If you have a small inheritance, it's double that, double one, or double ten, or double a hundred. Now there's another word that you can make up of those three letters. And that's the word Baruch, which means to bless. And the commentaries tell us the word blessing, what it effectively means is abundance. It's taking what is present and amplifying it and enlarging it, augmenting it, doubling it. That's the essence of a blessing. And that's why perhaps it too is comprised of these letters. Y'all have heard, I imagine, my calculation with the composite letters. We have a tradition that there are 600,000 letters in the Torah. One for every root soul that was present at Sinai. There were 600,000 root souls present at Sinai. Each one got one letter in the Torah. That's a very, very, very ancient idea. And it's found in the most reputable of sources. There's only one big problem. There aren't 600,000 letters in the Torah. We know the precise amount, and it's far from that number. It's about half the number. It's 304,805 letters. So 304 out of 600, it's about half. So a couple of years ago, I uh, recorded a podcast and a video. There's an, a, a nice accompanying slideshow as well. Not slideshow. PowerPoint presentation where I suggested a resolution to this problem and I calculated how the 304,805 letters of the Torah actually, on one dimension, equal precisely 600,000 letters, not one more, not one less. And that's because the letters are composite letters. And this is already an ancient idea. It's not a novel idea. The aforementioned Aleph, the way it is written, is as a diagonal Vav, and two Yuds, one on top, one on bottom. And thus, if you were to break down the letters into their composite parts, you'll discover that actually the individual letters, when separated, actually arrive to exactly 600,000 letters. Again, this is another element of the richness found in Hebrew. Now, Kabbalistically, all the letters are comp- are full of tons of secrets. And if you actually survey the Kabbalistic literature, you'll find a ton of of literature about the letters and what they represent and the secrets. And there's so much there. But we're also told, this is how deep the brilliance goes to, 
Every word is comprised of letters. Every letter has secrets. If you put together all those letters, you'll find that word. And that word, the secrets in that word, are actually the combination of the secrets of all those letters. And that's why there are many words in the Torah that are spelled sometimes with the added letters, meaning that the vowels are in the form of letters, and sometimes they're spelled missing the letters, meaning that the vowels are not in the form of letters, rather they are in the form of the nekudot, of the invisible vowels that go on top or below the letters. When the Torah wants to say something, but wants to minimize it in some way, it will reduce one of the letters and thus take away, so to speak, from the full impact of that word. Conversely, when the Torah wants to amplify a word, it just adds another letter, and with the letter comes all those secrets and all those deep, really unfathomably deep insights. And that is now the new word. Adam named the animals. In chapter 2, verse 20, we read how Adam gave names to all the animals, but he did not find a partner. What this means is he didn't just come up with a name. That looks like a giraffe. This one is a zebra. Adam was on such a lofty level before he was demoted from the garden. He was like Pitzalel. He understood the mechanisms of Genesis. And thus he was able to reverse engineer an animal to its secrets, to its roots, to its essence. And thus he was able to reveal the names and the proper letters for that thing. So he sees an animal and he says, this is a sus, a horse. Why? Because this animal, this creation of the Almighty, it is a samach and a vav and a samach. And this is its name. And that's what the, the verse tells us. That the name that Adam assigned, that is the essence of that thing forever. It's going to serve as its eternal name because it's its eternal essence. Now, if you want to try your hand at this, First of all, good luck. But there's a book. There's a book called Sefer Yitzira. A simple, handy guide for how to build worlds. And it's all about this. And of course, we're not Batsalel, and we're not Adam, so we have no idea what we're reading, but this is what the book is all about. It's based upon the understanding that this is the divine language. And it's actually possible to recreate Genesis, so to speak, on some level, through the same letters that the Almighty did originally. The Talmud tells us some humorous stories. It starts off like this. Rava... Rav is one of the sages of the Talmudic era. In fact, the name Rava appears more, more frequently than any other name in the Talmud. Rava bara gavra. Rava created a man. What? What? He created a man using Sefer Yitzira, using this book of creation, this book of Genesis. And he sent the man on a mission. And the man goes to the mission, and the person starts talking to the man, and the man doesn't respond. And he says, aha, humans could do Genesis up to a certain point. They cannot blow into the nostrils of said creature the soul of life. They cannot upgrade this to a human. Therefore, I know for sure you were created by one of my peers. Go back to your dust. 
And then the Talmud tells us of two sages, every Friday, they would study the Sefer Yitzhira. And they would create an iglatilsa, a fat calf. And they would eat it for Shabbos. So, what's for dinner? Let's go to the, uh, to the academy and find out. This, of course, should suffice for us to gain a deeper understanding of, of what it is that differentiates Hebrew, specifically biblical Hebrew, because the modern, the modern Hebrew, of course, is based upon it, but it's not quite the same thing. Now we know why this is different, but it goes even further. The Tower of Babel episode in chapter 11 of Genesis talks about the world and all the people speaking one language and and being unified in communication. Which language was that? That was Lashon HaKodesh, the Holy Tongue. That's what Adam spoke, and that's what people spoke, until they were dispersed. And this one language was bifurcated into 70, 70 emanations of this language. The Midrash tells us that this, this change was the result of the people conspiring and colluding to do terrible things. And that's, of course, the byproduct of them having a Yetzahara, an evil inclination. In the times of Messiah, there's going to be an undoing of the Yetzahara, and thus there will no longer be a need to have different languages to balkanize humanity and therefore, in the, fu- in the future, the Midrash tells us, we're going to go back and everyone's going to speak Hebrew. Tamuchan, are you ready? You ready to brush up on your Hebrew? This world was created with Hebrew, Lashon Kodesh. And that was the plan until we messed up. When we fit, we go back to the original plan. And all your fancy words in English that you learned, you're going to have to work really hard to brush up on your Hebrew because that's the language that we're going back to. So this language is the first language. It's the language of God. It's the language that God used to create the world. It's the divine language. And the words and the letters are all multidimensional and full of secrets. And this gets into the study of Torah. And again, the language has properties that are not found anywhere else, like the aforementioned gematria system and all the various different types of gematria. The large gematria, the small gematria, the reverse gematria, the nutricone, which I had a hard time. Like, how do I explain what Nutricone is. So I said, you know what? Let me, let me Google it. So I Googled it and it turns out there's a Wikipedia page for Nutricone. And this is what it says. Nutricone is a Talmudic and Kabbalistic method of deriving a word by using each of its initial, initial letters, I guess that is, initial or final letters. So either Roshi Tevos, the first letters of subsequent words or the sofe tevos, to stand for another, to form a sentence or idea out of the words. So that's a little wordy. It's a little complicated to figure out what that means. But you take a bunch of words, and you pull the first letters of those words, and you make a new word, which is just the first letters of those words. That's how I would say it. And then it tells us, Nutrika is one of the Three ancient methods used by the Kabbalists. The others are Gramatra and Temura, like, like Adbash, where you swap letters, you know, the first with the last, or the first with the, with the twelfth, or the first, or the, the one beforehand, all sorts of different methods. Uh, and this, this sentence I actually liked. These methods were used 
were used, are used, in order to derive the esoteric substratum. I like that words. I like that. And deeper spiritual meaning of the words in the Bible. Now, the reason why I'm reading this to you is because I like it, but it's actually not entirely accurate. It's not just a Talmudic and Kabbalistic method. It's featured in the Torah, chapter 17 of Genesis. Abraham is renamed Abraham. What's the rationale to rename Abraham Abraham? The Torah tells us. God tells Abraham, your name is no longer Abraham. Vahayashimcha Avraham. Your name will henceforth be Avraham, Abraham. Why? Key, because Av Hamon Goyim Nesaticha. I have placed you as the father of many nations. Now, when you read that in English, it makes no sense. Because Abraham is the father of many late nations. That's why he should be called Abraham. And what's the justification? So only if you read this in Hebrew will it make any sense and understanding that there's this system called Nutricon. So Rashi, of course, spells this out for us. The word Av, Hamon, that symbolizes uh, Avraham. That's the Nutricon for Avraham. And then Rashi says, wait a minute. Av Hamon, Aleph Beis, Hey Mem, of those two words, father of many. Where's the Reish? Why is it Avraham? It should be Avham. If Abraham is being renamed because of Av Hamon, father of many, many nations, it should be Avham. What an interesting question. So Rashi answers. Rashi says, well, previously it was called Avram because he was the father of Ram. What's Ram? Ram is Aram Naharaim, Mesopotamia. And now he's called Avham, but we're not going to delete that race. So he, his name should really be Avham, but we're not going to reduce a letter from him. The letter that was there previously, it's still true. He's still Avram. But he's now Avraham. So even though Avham is what we're, we're naming him, but the Reish that was there previously, that should, that should stick around. That should not be moved. That's why it's Avraham. So first of all, it tells us that the Nutrican system is found in the Torah. A. But this also tells us something amazing. The names in the Torah. Even the names of people. We think it's arbitrary. Oh, this is my son. His name is, uh, Sam, his name is Julian, his name is Francisco. What does that mean? I don't know, it's the name that we liked. Carter, Jackson, Pedro. Any name you pick, it's just a name that we like. In the Torah, we're told, the name, even Avram, Abraham, why was he called Abraham initially? So he tells us, he's called Abraham initially because he grew up in a place called Aram. And he was the Av, the father of Aram. So Avram. That's why he's called Abraham. Is it possible that his father named him some other name? Maybe. The reason why it's called Avram because that's what he was. He was the father of Aram. And therefore his name is Avram. And now he's, he's being upgraded He's being transformed. He's no longer just the father of Aram. He's now the father of the whole world. So it's Avraham. The reason why his name is being changed is because his essence is being upgraded as well. He was the father of Aram, and that's why he was called Avram. And now he's being upgraded to be the father of many nations, and that's why his name has to be updated to reflect his new essence. So, so there's no random names in the Torah either. Sarai means my my master. Sarah means the master of all. Just as Abraham, the father of Aram, was more of a limited fatherhood, is expanded to a more expansive fatherhood. Sarah being uh, the the Sarah being like the the mistress, the the minister, if you will, of 
a more limited sense, is now being upgraded as well to being a more expansive leader alongside Abraham. This is how the Torah is written. Every letter is meaningful. Every word has purpose. There's nothing that's random, and there's all sorts of layers, and we'll use that word from Wikipedia, substratum, deeper meanings, deeper insights, all sorts of subtleties and nuances. And it's not really called Hebrew. It's called Lashon HaKodesh. It's holy. We, of course, have a hard time with the word holy. We don't even know what what does it even mean to be holy. What's the definition of holiness? We're told that the Jewish people at Sinai, what was the pitch of Sinai? The pitch was, you will be for me a mamleches koyanim, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. The Jewish people became holy at Sinai. Well, what does that mean? It's hard for us to even define what holiness means. But this language is the language of holiness. And the sources tell us that it's important if we want to have holiness, to speak it and to teach it to our children. And the Midrash tells us, you should teach the Torah to your children. That's, of course, in the Shema. That means you should teach the Torah in its original language. And when a child starts speaking, speak to the child in Lashon HaKodesh, in Hebrew. And then it says something scary. And if you don't speak to him in Hebrew, and you don't teach him Torah right away at the initial stages of their speech, Ki'ilu kovro. It's as if you buried them. That's very harsh. It's very harsh words. But again, what this is telling us is that this is not just an ordinary language. This is a holy language. And if we want holiness in our children, we are best advised to speak to them in this language. We are currently reading the book of Exodus. And the Midrash tells us, Why did the Jewish people merit to be saved from Egypt? And it tells us one of the reasons is they did not change their language. There's something about this language that perpetuates and maintains the holiness that keeps the spark alive, keeps the ember of Abraham strong. When Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, the verse tells us in chapter 45 of Genesis, He proved it with his mouth. This is my mouth speaking to you. And Rashi tells us that this means that he spoke them in the holy tongue. Holiness in language is this language. And if there's a people who speak and perpetuate this language, that's enough proof that they've maintained their holiness. And it's not clear to us where the holiness lies. Why is this? A holy language. We say in our prayers and our liturgy, You have exalted us from all languages. Why is this the superior language? The Talmud tells us that when Joseph was promoted to be the viceroy of Egypt, the servants of Pharaoh didn't like that this Former slave will be a ruler. And they said, he, he's not a ruler. And Pharaoh says, no, no, no. He, he has kingly characteristics. And said, okay, well, does he speak all the languages? That's the requirement. That's a prerequisite. And the Talmud says that the, the angel came and taught Joseph all 70 languages. And Pharaoh says, let's inspect. Is he legit? Is he worthy of the throne? And Pharaoh started speaking to him in one language, two, three, four, 70 languages. And Joseph is fluent. And then Joseph says, well, there's one more language that you forgot. And he starts to speak to him in Hebrew. And Pharaoh says, what's this? 
I don't know this language. Teach it to me. Pharaoh says, teach it to me. So Joseph tries to teach it to him, and Pharaoh just doesn't learn it. It doesn't stick. And he says to him, I want you to swear that you'll never reveal this to me. There's a language that you know that I don't. It means that you're worthier for the throne than I am. And Joseph swore that he will not reveal that Pharaoh is ignorant in Hebrew. And the Talmud continues and says that this came in handy because when Joseph promised to bury Jacob in the land, he swore to him and because he swore to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was worried that if he made him violate the oath that he gave to his father, he will eventually violate the oath that he gave to Pharaoh as well. And because of this, he acceded to Joseph's request to bury his father in the land. So this is the narrative in the Talmud book of Sota, page 36b. And here's the question. Pharaoh was obviously gifted in languages. He could speak 70 languages. Why can he pick up Hebrew? And Joseph tries to teach him. And it doesn't, it doesn't click. It seems to me that this is the holy language. And Pharaoh, who is the, the essence of anti-holiness, he's just not capable of learning this. But it's not clear what exactly makes it what makes it holy? What about it is holy? So it's interesting that the medieval sages, many of them wrote about this and talked about this. And I want to share some ideas just to wrap this, this subject. Rambam, he has a very interesting take on why this language is called the holy language. He says that there are no nouns for the genitalia in Hebrew. It's like a, it's, it's a modest language. And the only way to say the, the words, or the only way to describe the, the anatomy of procreation is only if you use other words, use euphemisms. And that is, that's a sign of its holiness. It's a very, a very interesting idea that that the Rambam writes. The Ramban, he says something which is a little bit more lofty. He says, the words of the Torah, the words of the prophecies, God communicating to us, it's all done in Hebrew. The Ten Commandments, the touch point of heaven and earth was with Hebrew. The names of God as told us in the Torah are Hebrew. The creation of the world is in Hebrew. The names of the holy ones, of our holy antecedents, they are all in Hebrew. Which, by the way, this tells us that Hebrew cannot be expanded. It's, to a certain extent, it's a rigid language. Because any word that's not included in what God said to us via the prophets, it's not technically, at least according to the Ramban, it's not actually Hebrew, which is why you have words like televisia for television, or radio, radio. Or when you're driving and you want to make a right turn, you put on your blinker or your blinkerim. Or the, my, the, the, my favorite, an attache case, is a Dick James Bond. <laughs> it's a James Bond uh, bag. Only words that were included in the corpuses of the Torah are actually Hebrew. And there's a few other ideas. There's actually very uh, lengthy essays in the Kuzri about this. And he says something, another, a few interesting things. He says that this is the only language that was not corrupted via the Tower of Babel episode. And then he adds, it's the richest language and it could convey ideas with utmost precision. This is all a long way of saying that this is a very, very special language. And if we have a foothold in it, we should appreciate it. We should cherish it. And if we have yet to study it or to master it, 
This should encourage us. It should nudge us to deepen our immersion in it. And we see it's a holy language. And the more we're associated with it, the more we're associated with, with holiness. The Jewish people in Egypt, because they clung to Hebrew, that's the merit that earned them the salvation of the Exodus. Moreover, I think this is perhaps a scary thought, but one that it's hard to deny is, is one that, that has some truth to it. We don't know how much longer America will be hospitable for Jews. Europe was hospitable for Jews for a very long time until it wasn't. And it's a pattern throughout all of Jewish history that we can never be sure that we'll be forever safe and secure in a given place. And again, I'm not a prophet. I'm not making any predictions and I'm not saying anything about geopolitics like that. It's a good idea to have a little basic understanding in Hebrew, but primarily, if someone wants to study Torah and wants to be serious about it, to read the Torah in the original language, you are able to access so many more subtleties and nuances, and certainly the depths of Torah are only possible in the original language. It's important for us to appreciate the unique brilliance of biblical Hebrew and to do what we can to gain an understanding and to deepen and to expand and to broaden our understanding of this language of the divine. I appreciate your attention. Thank you for listening. Have an incredible day. And as always, my email address is rabbiwalbeatjimba.com. Send me your questions, your comments, and your feedback. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Again, the website for the Torch fundraiser, for the annual Torch fundraiser, is happening right now. The website is givetorch.org. Every donation is doubled. Please visit givetorch.org. The link is in the description. Give a click on the link and give what you can give and support the great work of Torch in 2024. Again, the website is givetorch.org.